Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. So we're going to continue this study uh, that we started yesterday on, on looking at uh, Daniel chapter 12. And uh, I probably made the mistake of reading too much stuff since last study, but uh, we'll try to not uh, add too many elements to the study. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we welcome your presence here into this study this morning, and we're thankful that we can once again open your word together, and we are thankful for this opportunity that we have each day um, to study your word and to receive light from you. We know, Lord, that there is still much that we do not understand. We just ask, Lord, that you can help us as we struggle with these things. Help us to come with a correct understanding of truth and that we can be affected by it and that our faith can be strengthened. Help us to trust in you and not in ourselves. May your Holy Spirit be here now as we open your word together. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, well, good morning, everyone. So in in the study yesterday, I, I went over a lot of the, the symbols um, that are in Revelation chapter 12. And I started reading um, some of the pioneers' writings, um, uh, lots of different things that I've read to try to figure out how they understood it. Um, and why they understood it that way. And there are, are some reasons that uh, I ran into that I wasn't familiar with. Um, so uh, in trying to figure out exactly how we're going to approach this without getting uh, too bogged down, the uh, first thing we want to do is just uh, review briefly what we looked at yesterday. So we know when we look at Revelation chapter 12 that this beast is obviously different from the beast of Revelation 13 and the beast of Revelation 17. It's different in um, the time in which it occurs. And because of the time in which it occurs, there, these differences of, for instance, the crowns on the heads in 12, the crowns on the horns in 13 instead of the heads, and no crowns on the beast in Revelation 17, tell us that, that there's these different time periods. Now, the question of whether um, we can uh, say that the heads are the same in all of them or that the horns are the same in all of them is still something that we haven't answered yet. Um, but what we can say is that if we are going to understand uh, the beast in Revelation or the dragon, really, in Revelation chapter 12, um, that it needs to be understood in the time in which it occurs. So, so we looked at the symbols. We could see that there's this woman, which is the church. Uh, we have symbols that are from the story of Joseph, from Genesis chapter 1, uh, you know, the moon, the sun, the stars. Here in this case, we can see that um, this woman is clothed with them. We looked at the symbol of the Virgin um, and how that applies not just to the to the church, but also how we can apply it to the start of the 2520 for northern Israel uh, from Isaiah chapter 7. Um, we connected this also to Genesis chapter 3 with the serpent and uh, the seed of the woman. And so we can see that this is obviously the serpent and the seed of the woman. The serpent is wanting to uh, destroy the seed of the woman. So that seed, of course, here in this context is Christ, but also uh, the church, right? The followers of Christ that are, are going to follow because uh, we're going to see that um, we have this child and then we're going to have, uh, just hang on, and then we're going to have um, this dragon introduced, right? And then you're going to have uh, this woman who is 
uh, going to be sought after. So this woman, of course, is the church. So we can say, well, the church produces the seed, but we know that literal Israel isn't uh, the one that goes into the wilderness for 1260 years. So I mean, it is God's people. Uh, but so it's the seed of the woman. It's the woman. It's herself. There's part of the same thing to some degree. Um, uh, we have this flood, right? This persecution that chases, chases after the woman, the earth helping the woman. So it brings us from the time of Christ to the 1260 year period. So it brings us through all of this, this time. And chapter 13 is going to come to the end of that 1260. So we, we've, recognize that and then in chapter 17 the question still remains how do we place this now our view is that we definitely place the vision as in the future that is this beast here is the beast at the end of the world uh, the question has to do with how do we uh, place the prophet john from the perspective when he says fire or follow one is and so we haven't really addressed that yet <clears throat> um we also addressed, of course, uh, that there is these casting downs of that occur, right? So Satan is cast down at the beginning of the world. He's cast down again at the time of Christ, and he will be cast down again in the future. Um, and we use some spirit prophecy and Bible quotes uh, to address that. Um, and then there was anything else that... Is important that I should mention. Can't, can't think of anything else. I think that's kind of what we covered. Now, we wanted to look at, at the pioneers' understanding of Revelation 12. Now, I, I went through a bunch of the different um, articles, but the best place that I found is actually uh, Uriah Smith's summation of this. That is, he brings together a lot of these arguments. So one of the things we see in the Pioneer's writings is uh, when you're addressing uh, Revelation chapter 12, their focus tends to be mostly upon uh, 13 and 17. So when they're talking about the heads and they're talking about the horns, uh, they're more, more focused upon 13 and 17 um, and not as much on Revelation 12. So if you start studying Revelation 12, like Miller, he'll say, well, look at chapter 13. Um, but there's things that they don't address all in one place. They address them at di in different places. And so to put that together uh, would take a bit of time for me to go through all of those quotes. Now, we do have Uriah Smith's paper on this. So Uriah Smith wrote uh, a study on the seven heads of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Um, and this, he he just was for people he knew and stuff. It was a limited tract, it says. Um, so it was free that he gave out. And so he was just trying to persuade people. I guess it's like doing a video on YouTube nowadays. Um, and and it's a fairly long paper. So um, it is, how many pages? 35 pages. So I don't usually like to go through and read really, really long papers. Um, but I, I haven't gone through it enough to say, here's what we should just read. <clears throat> so I will send this out to people so people can read the whole thing. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Now, we also know, of course, that Uriah Smith had some troubles. He, he tends to stick to a lot of the pioneers' views of things. Um, so in that sense, he's sort of a conservative theologian, um, though we know that he rejected the 2520 of Miller, which would be inconsistent with how you look at other things of the pioneers' writings that he accepted. 
And the thing that I know about Uriah Smith, just from reading his his various books through the years, is he tends to have a polemical style, which I'm not really a fan of. It is, I don't like to read things that are arguing a position um, and looking at uh, the other view that is in a polemical style. It's the type of argumentative style where, uh, and, and you could think of that, let's say if you were in a court and you were listening to uh, the prosecution's uh, account of the case and the evidence, and then the defense's uh, account of the case and the evidence. Uh, you're going to always uh, characterize the other person's position in its weakest forms. You're going to find the things that you can attack, and uh, you're going to ignore the weak arguments within your own position. And and so I, I've never liked that polemical style. I think it, it, I personally think it's dishonest. That is, if I'm going to be trying to find the truth of something, if I want to convince someone, I definitely don't want to be deceptive in any way. I don't want to sort of hide uh, what are the strengths of some argument that goes against what I'm saying. And, and I definitely don't want to minimize or, or sort of find these weak points in an argument because if I win the argument merely because I'm a clever arguer, uh, then I serve nobody, um, uh, you know, it, it serves no good purpose for anybody, I, I, neither for me or the person that I'm arguing against or anybody observing. So the idea is that we would like to look at things objectively. And I don't think that Uriah Smith does that in anything that I've read of his. Even when he's on the side of truth, I find that he he mischaracterizes arguments against what he's saying, and he never a, uh, examines the weakness of his own arguments. And so, so that's one thing about Smith that I don't like. Um, um, now, of course, it was pretty common in the day. It's still probably common today as well. But, um, <clears throat> but we're going to read some of this here. So he says, in advocating the view that the seven heads of the dragon of Revelation 12 and the beasts of Revelation 13 and 17 represent seven forms of government that have existed in the Roman Empire, the writer deems it necessary to remind the reader that he is not dealing with in novelties. He's not introducing a new view to appeal to the curiosity of the reader. So Uriah Smith is going to present not just the pioneer view, but the view that has long been held by Christians regarding Revelation chapter 12, that it would be Protestants, that they would understand Revelation 12 in this way. Um, now he says, but the view which will be advocated in this paper is one which has characterized the Adventist movement from the beginning uh, through first, second, and third messages to the present time, and is only beginning within a few years to be called into question. So, at this time later in Uriah Smith's life, you're going to see uh, new views being advocated regarding uh, the beast of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And um, uh, some of them are, are ones that are basically uh, related to the views that we, we hold. So, so he's going to see these things as, as errors. And... Um, you know, new ideas that are being introduced that are undermining the foundation of Adventism. So he's going to go and talk a bit about all these different people that have these views. Uh, but um, we know that these the list of these has been sometimes debated exactly how to, to name it. Um, but basically, uh, kings, consuls, dissimilars, dissimilars, dictators, triumvirs, emperors and popes. So that would be generally the list um, as the forms of Roman government represented by the seven heads of the dragon of Revelation. So we talked about that before. Um, now, right now, so we're going to look at the pioneer's view, but we're not, we're not gonna stop there, right? So we, we first looked at, at the symbols. Now we're gonna look at the pioneer's view. But we're going to come back to the scriptures 
And the reason why we're looking at this, obviously, is it's the pioneer's view. So it, it needs to be examined. Um, and, and I think that that's a mistake that uh, we can make sometimes is just dismissing what the pioneers believed simply because it doesn't fit in with our thinking. So we just say, well, they were wrong about that. It's really easy to say. But if we don't understand their reasoning, um, we have no right to reject it. Uh, would people agree with us there that we need to understand what the pioneers taught? Even, even if, um, you know, we find there's some things wrong, we would still need to understand it. Hopefully people agree with that. Okay. So he says here, but the view that the seven heads of the dragon of Revelation 12 represent seven forms of government that were developed in the Roman Empire alone is now called into question, whether with good reason or not. It is the purpose of this paper to try to determine. The new views which are now brought forth to take the place of the old vary with every different exponent, uh, but it will be necessary to notice only those to which most prominence has been given. But before this is done, a few words must be offered to show that the dragon, what the dragon itself signifies. Now he's going to go through and show that the dragon uh, represents pagan Rome, primarily Satan. He's going to give the quote uh, that Ellen White has um, uh, that we looked at before, where it says, uh, let me see, in the great controversy. Um, <clears throat> where she says the dragon is said to be Satan. He is, he it was that moved upon Herod to put the savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman empire in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. And so he says, this is the most reasonable uh, and scriptural view to take on this matter. So that's something I think we can all agree on. Now he's talking a lot about how people try to apply it to Satan in different ways. Um, he talks a bit about how the dragon represents Egypt in the book of Ezekiel chapter 29. Um, and then he talks here about uh, John had the vision of Revelation in AD 96. And here he is shown a symbol of the government under which he lived and was suffering persecution. So then he's going to go through and make this argument um, that, that um, when you're dealing with prophecy, you're not going to go all the way back. That is, you're not going to go every time all the way back to Babylon, that you're going to deal with within that immediate context of the person, the prophet who is receiving that vision or that prophecy. Um, now he says, of course, we're going back within the government of Rome, because we're looking at this progression of this government of Rome that's coming, right? So he's going to talk a bit about how different people deal with kingdoms, right? So you've got Babylon, the Persia, Greece, Rome pagan, Rome papal, united Italy, right? A future yet unknown, the papacy restored. That's this part here. Um, the end of that par paragraph there, you see where he talks about that. And I'm just make this bigger. So, so you can see that this view here is fairly similar to what we have have understood. Now, obviously, uh, the United Italy, right? We we, we wouldn't have that. Um, and so, so this is Revelation 17, of course, that they're talking about. He says another view leaves out United Italy and gives in its stead the pago. Protestant nations of Europe as the sixth head, right? So there's going to be different views. Now, when I became an Adventist, um, the most prominent view was Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome pagan, Rome papal, and communism or spiritualism as the sixth. And then United States as the seventh. This was the view of Roy Allen Anderson. And so this this doesn't, of course, this contradict spirit of prophecy because she's clear that the United States rises in 1798 at the time of the end. Um, but they're going to put communism really starting with France, right? The French Revolution, because France is the one 
that takes the Pope captive. And that's why they put communism or socialism or spiritualism there. Um, but we, we put the United States there. And, and we can still say, of course, even if these heads didn't represent that, we would still say these are the kingdoms of Bible prophecy according to the book of Daniel. So we, we could find these in other ways, even if these weren't the heads. Now, we also talked about the idea that the heads could be different things in each of the different beasts, which doesn't seem to ever be a position that anyone takes. That is, people always want the heads, if they, they have them to be the forms of Roman government, always to be the forms of Roman government, or if they want uh, the heads to be uh, these kingdoms, they're always going to be the same kingdoms, right? So I don't know if that that is logical, um, and, and especially with the horns as well. So that's one of the real problems that we have. If we go back to Daniel uh, chapter 2 and we look at the feet with the toes, if you're always going to have the toes be the kingdoms of Europe, it, it becomes difficult to just say, well, those are the United Nations, uh, the Ten Kings at the end of the world, because that would be a different group. And he addresses that argument a bit, but he doesn't really give a satisfactory answer, not, not so much about the UN, but just that the Ten Toes are different things. Okay. Um, so some of his arguments don't make any sense, but um, he's at least uh, showing what was understood. Um, so it says, it may be asked if, on the ground that these seven heads denote the seven forms of government in the Roman Empire, the prophecy does not come back to a time centuries before John's day when some of these heads existed. Very true. But it does not go outside the government to which they belonged, as they were features which belonged to that government which the angel was then showing to John. It was necessary to go back far enough to take them all in. It was necessary to show the government in its entirety. The view would not have been complete without this, but to suppose that the symbol goes outside of Rome to bury nations which never had any connection with Rome is to suppose that the prophecy brings in a lot of effet and dead matter, useless lumber, lifeless members, which had no connection and never had any connection with the government then reigning and passing under review when this vision was given to John. Such an application is thus shown to be an unnatural as well as unscriptural. Now, so this is the argument. So what do we think of this argument? So the, do you see what the argument is? That, that this is pagan Rome, right? We, we know that this beast is pagan Rome. It's, it's on the 1843 chart. It's pagan Rome, okay. And he's saying, well... We can't bring anything to this beast that's outside of pagan Rome. So to have its head be a kingdom that's outside of Rome would be unnatural as well as unscriptural. So what do we think of that argument? Is it a, is it a good argument? Well, if we're going to look at that in Revelation 17, if the mm -hmm. heads are going to be Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, people, USA, UN, they're all in a sense, there's, there's maybe like a connection with Rome, but in a sense, you couldn't say that they're all inside of Rome. Maybe the, the UN, UN being controlled by Rome to some degree, United States, you wouldn't say would be controlled by Rome at all until later on. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't really accept that argument. Okay. So so we, we take a position, as far as I understand, that the Beast of Revelation 12 is pagan Rome. The Beast of Revelation 13, the seven-headed, ten-horned beast, is, is papal Rome. And... And generally, I think the view that we have on the Beast of Revelation 17 is that it's modern Rome. Right? We don't say it's pagan Rome and we don't say it's papal Rome. Now, 
One of the things about the beast in Revelation 17, and we'll look at this more when we get there, is that the woman who's riding the beast is Babylon the Great. So one is we have a symbol there, which goes all the way back to Babylon, right? Yes, in spiritual sense, it can be Babylon, but it's not going right, to be so we know it's, it's, Yeah, it's spiritual Babylon, yeah. But still, it's it's a symbol that is Babylon. It's not a symbol that is Rome. It doesn't say mystery Rome the Great. You know, it's Babylon the Great. It brings us back to Babylon. So it shows us that there is something there that goes all the way back to Babylon, right? But because the reason it's called spiritual, the reason it's called Babylon is it inherits something from Babylon itself. And now what does it inherit? What does what does papal Rome, what does the woman inherit from Babylon and how does she inherit it? Well, yeah, so we would, she's got this cup of her fornication, right? Mother of harlots, abominations of the earth, cups filled with the filthiness of her fornications. Do you understand? She in a, <clears throat> sorry, she believes in a false god, Tammuz, that ro that rose rose from from the dead. So there you have the counterfeit of Christ. Yeah. Well, well, Tammuz doesn't rise from the dead. Um, well, that's what I've read. I know, but it's it's incorrect. You you won't find that in any any Babylonian. Uh, documents or anything in their religion so so Tammuz does not rise from the dead um, there is a weeping for Tammuz which happens um, but there is nothing about Tammuz rising from the dead but anyway um, but yes so there is this false religious system that goes back to Babylon so this would be the mystery religion this is the astrology of Babylon right the worship of the gods that are represented by uh, the constellations, right? That that's what Babylon is about. It's it's this worship of of the sky, right? Including the sun, and the moon, and the stars. And the sense is world domination as well. If you go back to Arabiable, like Nimrod at that time, yeah. you have like a a sort of gathering the unity of man against God. Okay, yeah. So, um, so Babel, which we often associate with Babylon, and there is some association, but um, not as strong as sometimes people try to make it. I mean, there is obviously uh, a connection, right? So we're not saying there isn't a connection because we know about the land of Shinar and and how it's related. In, in the scriptures. So, um, but the characteristic here when we're talking about spiritual Babylon, it's, it's going to really deal with the Neo Babylonian Empire. But there is the sense of the idea that the first um, idea where you have a king standing in the place of God comes from Babel, right? That's going to be Nimrod. Okay, so you're going to have this idea of of this religious government. So, so that characteristic is there. But when we're dealing with uh, this woman, she's a church. And how is she, how is she then connected to the governments of the world? She's committing fornication with them, right? That's what's happening in Revelation 17.
So one thing we will see is we see the woman herself goes back to Babylon. Right? We can agree with that. Even though this is Rome, Rome has inherited something from Babylon. It's even inherited the title Babylon, right, in Revelation 17. Okay, so how does this relate to his argument? So he has this argument that it's the government that you're under at that time that you're going to be addressing, and John is in the time of Rome, and so the beast that he sees is pagan Rome. And um, so it can't go back to Babylon. But if we look at Revelation 17, we can see that this woman, she goes back to Babylon, right? It's even called Babylon. Even though it's spiritual Babylon, it's still connected to Babylon. So to me, this argument could be set aside just from the example of Revelation 17. We could say that Rome is a continuation of Babylon. And so that the heads could represent these governments that that preceded it because it has those characteristics. Rome, Rome is a synchronistic power, right? So it's going to have aspects of it that are Babylon. It's going to have aspect of, of it that is comes from Medo-Persia. It's going to have aspects of it that comes from Greece, right? So, so we could render this argument... Uh, faulty on that basis right he's not going to address that he's going to frame his argument in such a way that his argument makes sense but he's not going to show the weakness of this argument but i think there is a weakness there can we agree that there's a weakness in this argument So, so the other aspect is we know that there's five that are fallen and one is when we get to Revelation 17. So in Revelation 17, the question is, where is that question being asked from or being answered from, I guess, even when it says five are fallen? Because if we put the five are fallen in the time of Rome. And we're saying that it's the kingdoms. Would that work? It can. It could. You could have five kingdoms that had fallen that you could list in 96 AD. Are we looking just at 96 AD or are we looking at this for today as well? No, but I'm just saying, no, we're looking at it from the point of in Revelation 17, what time when the angel says five are fallen, we make an application of it. The question is, John is go, is is um, you know being talked to by the angel. The angel's explaining the vision, saying five are fallen, one is and one is yet to come. Is the angel talking from the point of the time of John? If the angel is talking from the time of John, and we're going to say that the five are fallen are kingdoms. I don't see how we could have five kingdoms that are fallen. All right. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia and Greece, that's three. Even if you add it in Egypt, that's only four are fallen because Rome hasn't fallen yet in the first century. Right. So, so you can see that the idea that they're nations um, is, is dependent upon Revelation 17 being in 1798 that is the, the angels talking to john in 1798 and and there's problems with that problems we're we're, we're going to show that when you go through um how john's visions are given that things are going to and you see this in chapter 11 where you're going to see that um he's seen something that's in the future 
but the explanation is going to be in a different tense. So, uh, so when it's in the future, it's as it has happened already. That's the completed tense in Hebrew, um, which John is writing in in broken Greek from from the point of a Hebrew speaker in the Book of Revelation. And then when it's um, when he's uh, uh, given the explanation, the explanation is about what's going to happen. So, so he sees it in 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 the incomplete tense when he's being talked to. But when he sees the vision, he sees it in the completed tense, and that's the normal sense in which Hebrew prophecy is done. If you're talking about the future, you say it as if it's completed. You see it as if it's completed, right? But when you're 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 going to talk about it. You're going to talk about it as incomplete. It's still in the future. So we, we'll see that. So, so there is a problem with the idea that, um, that in, seven, in, in Revelation 17, that the explanation is given, and we, we would have to take that as five or fallen in 1798. There's a problem, but maybe we can solve that problem. But you can see that oh. one of the main issues in this whole argument about these heads. So when we deal with these symbols, you know, we can look at these symbols and we can make some arguments. But we need to know what the basic problem is that has to be resolved, right? Because people could argue about what the heads are, or you know, just from other ways. But you have to know that those two things are tied together. Where you place the explanation. Okay, somebody was going to say something, Stephen. Yes, just um, going back to Revelation 13, with John being in the sands of the sea, I'm looking back, he's in a sense saying the beast, whatever, these kingdoms which are fallen. And uh, so there he's 1798, in a sense, he's looking back at the five fallen. And an aspect, I know he's looking at Rome, mm -hmm. which is stable Rome, chiefly, where he takes the two when the deadly one is healed. Oh, sorry, when the deadly one occurs okay. and then okay it takes us to why it's healed as well but you know in a sense but i'm just thinking that you can maybe see five have fallen in revelation 13. okay but yours is kind of a circular argument so i agree with you he is in 1798 in revelation 13. right so that's pretty clear Right. So so if they are our kingdoms, definitely we could say in 1798, five kingdoms have fallen. Right. So so that would be consistent. But we know that in vision, he is brought to 1798. In Revelation 13. Right. That That's not a question. We know where he is. In Revelation 17, though, uh, we also are arguing that he's in 1798, right? Well, not 1798, but after 1798. So when you say uh, the one is, that would be the United States. So that's the position we've taken. It's still going to be the beast at the end of the world, but it's further on past 1798, prior to the Sunday law. Right, because he's going to talk about well, there's still going to be these kings and they haven't reigned yet. So, so you can't say that in Revelation 17 he's he's right at 1798. Revelation 13, you're right at the end of the 1260, the beginning of when you see the United States rise in 1798. Does that make sense, Stephen? Well, he sees the woman with the trunk, trunk with the blood of the saints. And she has daughters. Yeah. And then he's saying that one is. So I think he's just really at that point in 1798, where he's right at the end of that 1260 and beginning of the time of so the United States. In one is. So you're saying that in Revelation 17, it's exactly at the same point as Revelation 13. In some respects, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, 
yeah, my, my view always was it, it, when it's these kingdoms is that it's it's sometime after 1798, but during the time of the United States. So it's it's covering that whole period of the time of the United States. Uh, the days of one king, right? The 70 years of of Isaiah. Right. And that you're going to have Tyre, right? The whole the whole story there, which which Jeff addresses as well in in some of these recent articles. But but the point is that I, that I'm trying to make here is that we can't use a circular argument. We can't say, well, because we have these five kingdoms, then we we can place uh, the explanation given by the angel as from the perspective of 1798. Right. So when we go there, when we're going to look at this in more detail later, but we just need to address this point because this is the point that um, I think is the crux of, of the matter. Right. That is the timing of. Of the, the riddle that is where we are. So when you look. Um, um, so let me see here. So he's going to show him the judgment. He carried me away into the spirit of the wilderness. So he's going to see the judgment of the great whore. And John's going to be carried away into the spirit, into the wilderness. So here we would say, well, that's 17. That's the end of the 1260, right? So you're going to see the end of this woman. She's sitting upon a scarlet colored beast, right? That's these kingdoms of the world full of names of blasphemy, having said seven heads and ten horns. So she's sitting upon this beast. It's a scarlet-colored beast. It's not the great red dragon. And it's not the beast of Revelation 13, which looks like a leopard, his feet of a bear, mouth of a lion. This this is a scarlet-colored beast. And, and the woman is riding it, right? And, and she's arrayed in all these different things. She's called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. So this is what Stephen was referring to. This is talking about at the end of her persecutory power. And so definitely he here is brought to 1798 at the end of the papacy, right? We can all agree with that, that that's where John is brought to. Now, notice it's all in the completed sense. Right. Some of it's sort of in the present sense, tense, you know, just not in a tense at all. But. There's nothing here about future. He's not looking at something of and saying, I saw that she would be this way or that way. Because he, when he's in vision, when a prophet's in vision, he doesn't describe things as, as if they're future. He describes them as if they're happening or have happened. Right? Does that make sense? When a prophet's in vision. So let, let's, for instance, um, let's go back to Daniel chapter seven. So Daniel's going to have a vision, right? And behold, four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. The four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. He's having a vision, right? Behold, another beast, the second like unto a bear, right? He's going to go through and see these things happening. Uh I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was as white as snow. The fiery stream issued and came from before him. Right. So all this is either in the present tense or the completed tense. So then Daniel's going to receive the interpretation. And in, and the, in verse um, uh, 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. 
Now, I had a friend who didn't understand this. And um, he said, well, first, has Babylon already arisen at the time Daniel had this vision? Yes. Okay. So is, is Babylon going to arise out of the earth? No, it already has arisen. Okay. So, so he just said, well, this can't be talking about Babylon because these are four kings that are going to arise out of the earth. Now, the thing that people don't understand about Hebrew, and this is the same in the book of Revelation, because even though the book of Revelation is written in Greek, it's written in broken Greek. That is, it's not written in good Greek like John's gospel or his letters because he didn't have somebody to correct it, to proofread what he was writing. So he wrote it in the best Greek that he could, and he wrote it from the perspective of a Hebrew speaker. That is, it's written in Hebrew idioms, Hebrew expressions, and Hebrew tenses. And in Hebrew, you have either a complete or an incomplete tense. That is, something is completed or it's not completed. And we think of not completed as future, and we think of completed as past. But that's not really how it is. So when it says, four kings which shall arise out of the earth, it's just talking about the fact that in this vision, this vision is being explained in an incomplete tense, right? He sees it in a completed or just a present tense. Now, the present tense is just, uh, um, I can't think of the word for it, but it's just, you know, something is, right? Um, does it mean it's not really truly a tense, right? Uh, I can't think of the word for it, but you know, there's a grammar term for it. Um, so the saints of the Mo Most High shall take the kingdom. So that's an incomplete tense and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. I would know that I would know then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, etc. And the ten horns that were in his head and of the others which came up. Right. So he's going to talk about it because of what he saw in vision. I beheld and made the horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came. And thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, right? So again, it's talking about something future. Ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after him, right? So you can see in the explanation, it's going to be in the incompleted tense because it's still future. But in the vision itself, it's going to be wherever that prophet is brought to OK, so so if we go to Revelation 17, then and we look at it in that context. Um, he's going to see these things. They're going to be in uh, the completed or, you know, the present tense. And the beast that saw us was and is not. Now, this is the angel speaking. Right. The beast that thou sawest was. So this is something that existed in the past, is not, doesn't exist now, and shall ascend out of the bottom of this pit. Now, this is the one where we really have this problem because the idea that five are fallen and one is, these are talking about the heads, right, which are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And five are fallen, and one is, and another is not yet come. Now, with the beast, it says the beast was and is not, right? So we would need to understand what that means. Why, with the kings, there's the one that is, and I'm not saying we're gonna we're not gonna study this right now, but I'm just explaining the problem here. The problem is that we have an explanation which is future. And normally that would be from the perspective of the prophet himself when he is living, right? So we're going to have to figure out how we address that, right? 
But we also know that the beast was and is not. He's going to be the eighth and is of the seven. Now, the way that we read that is the beast is one of the heads. Right? Correct? Is that what we say? So if the beast is one of the heads, what beast is this? Was for resurrected. Okay. So if the beast is one of the heads, right? If we go the beast, what is the beast here? Is the beast this the seven this this beast that the woman's riding with seven heads and ten horns? That's that's the question I'm asking. Is the beast that beast? Or is this some other beast? To me, it's just like it has to be the papacy because uh, okay, he, so he, he 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 takes over. He impersonates Christ in the sense that he has a death and resurrection, and there's a sort so of way of Christ. He Christ or God was he he was and is to come and. Yes, it's a sort of like similar word, but applied to the Antichrist. Okay, so when we go back to verse 8, it says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not. Could this beast be referencing the beast of Revelation 13? Uh, me, the way that I see is uh, this beast, when we look at. Uh, because it's saying the scarlet beast, which simply means we need to identify where we found a beast which is scarlet color, meaning it's coming back. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I understand. You're saying the scarlet colored beast. So, I mean, the scarlet colored beast is not the great red dragon, right? But this woman is riding a scarlet colored beast. Yes. So yeah. What's that? This beast. I mean, the woman who's uh, riding the beast. The yeah, woman so is she, not the papacy. So this is the papacy. Now we know that in Revelation 13, the papal beast is the papacy, right? The composite beast. That right. looks like Peter, right? That's the papacy. Now, is it possible that when it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not, that this beast is referring to the beast of Revelation 13, not to the beast that the woman is riding? Okay. Because it says in verse 11, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. So if it's the papacy, we can say that the papacy is one of the seven heads of this scarlet colored beast. Right? I know this is kind of a, a little bit different thinking than, than we've had, but the big problem that people have always had with Revelation 17 is you have the papacy riding a beast. Right. And so we know that, that this beast is the kingdoms of the world. It's not the papacy. The beast is not riding the papacy. Or, or the yes. woman's not riding the papacy. She's, she's riding this beast. So the beast isn't the papal beast. It's not the beast of Revelation 13. But is it possible that the beast of Revelation 13 is the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit that it talks about? Um, now, we know here, so, so I, and I'm not giving an answer here. I'm just asking some questions. Because when we look at this beast here that she's riding, um, he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy. 
Now, does it say anything about this beast coming up out of the bottomless pit? In this first part. Right, so we sometimes limit ourselves to this chapter. So when it says, the beast that thou sawest was in its not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, right? We just say, we just assume that this beast here that was and is not, is this beast. But can we say that the, that the kingdoms of the earth cease to exist? It maybe, you know, different solutions have been given. One is that we say, well, this is once... Uh, we have the United States rises. We don't have kings. And so um, that means it, it, it is not, right? So that's one explanation. But also we could just say that this beast that was and is not, uh, which has these characteristics of Satan, right? Because Jesus Christ is him that was, which is, which was, and which is to come. Now we see this this characteristic of was, is not, and yet is, right? That this is, is a reference to the papal beast of Revelation 13. So that's one solution, okay? I'm not saying it's correct, but I'm just trying to point out some of the problems that have arisen, that, that we have to have something that's consistent that's going to get rid of that. Now, I'm not saying that that's the best solution. I'm just saying that that's one solution people look at. They say, well, the beast here is the beast of Revelation 13. Now, when we deal with the eighth, right, it says he's going to be uh, the beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth and is of the seven. Right. So if he's the eighth, it just means we have a, the eighth would be a head. Right. But this head is a head that's already existed. So it's just another head. So it's so that means we have these seven heads that progress. But one of those heads is going to be repeated again, that it's going to be resurrected. Right. So, of course, we go back to a beast that received a deadly wound. Um, the beast that received a deadly wound is this first beast. Right. Right. And one of its heads, one of its heads was, as it were, were wounded unto death. So the one that was wounded unto death is the papal head, right? Yes. Yeah. So this is what we this is what we understand. So we understand then that the eighth is the head that was wounded unto death, the papal head. That's how we look at it. But it's not saying that one of the heads. Is this this is the beast? It's one of its head. It's taking the whole beast, right? The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. So it's going to take the papacy, and and one of its heads was wounded unto death. So they need to realize what that head is. That would be this form of government. If if we took the other one, the the pioneers view, it's a form of government. That would be the papal form of government. Received a deadly wound. And it's going to be resurrected at the end. If we're saying it's just Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, then it would be, again, the papal head that receives a deadly wound. Both are consistent. Okay. But we're going to come back to Revelation 17 and address it. The main point that I'm trying to make here is that there are things we haven't examined. But one of the things that we need to, to look at is it talks about the present tense. There was a beast that was, so that's the past tense, that is not. We need to know well, what is not. Now, this solution here, where we say that this is the papal beast, that is consistent with what we've been teaching, right? So we've said the one that is not is the head that was wounded unto death. The head that was wounded unto death is the papacy. And so the only way in which that could be said is if we were talking about this from the perspective of 1798. Okay. So that's one solution. Okay. But there are other solutions. 
Now that's the one that basically I think we understand. We, have, we haven't really differentiated that beast from the other beast, but it would be consistent. It would solve that problem that had existed in my mind, at least for 40 years. So, <clears throat> but anyway, we, we have other ways we can look at. So when we go back to Revelation 17, we will address that. Now, the point that we're making again is that we need to know what time this occurred. That is, that is, without knowing the time that this occurs, we can't unravel the riddle. That is, the explanation has to be from a certain perspective. Now, we also have this even within um, what Colin was saying about Trump. Because if you're going to say five are fallen, one is. Um, so the five are, five are fallen, the one is being Trump, right? So you have to have five before him. Right? So, or, or you're going to say uh, that Trump is the one that's fallen, right? He's the fifth one, and he's fallen. So then if you did it that way, you would be in the time of Biden, right? Or something after Trump, correct? So how would you, and, and so that's one of the things that we have to address if you're going to make that application. How, you de how do you decide where you place the is? Where, where does the is exist? When does it exist? Is that clear to people that that's, that's really one of the major issues? Yeah, I suggest that it lined up 1798. Um, in a sense, that would be right at the beginning of Trump's presidency. So the one that is would be the 20th of January. Uh, 2017, when Trump was 70 years old, seven months and seven days. And that would kind of line up with 1989 being the time they end. Uh, also, like 1798, you have the time they end in, in 1989. And then you have there a period of 777 days. So in the sense that you maybe tie that 777, connecting that with the one that is. Mm -hmm. And so like Jeff, and he's in Lambert Church on the Lord's Day, and he's kind of tying out in with John, being in the Lord's Day in the Spirit, and he's kind of, hears this voice that sounds like a trumpet, mm -hmm. and uh, and Jeff's doing a sermon called A Certain Sound, which is give the trumpet a certain sound. You have similar trumpet analogies, and he's, in a sense, he's not taken away in the spirit, but he's, he's kind of bringing the people of that church to the 20th of January 2017 and saying one is, in a sense, you know, that, uh, well, Trump's going to be there. That's what he's kind of alluding to in that, ser in that sermon. Yeah, well, no, it wasn't really part. Was, yeah, it wasn't really part of the sermon, but it was kind of more like it's just a, something that is just adding, throwing in there just before you began the sermon. Okay, and, and Colin puts the one is after Trump is one of the ones that's fallen, right? Is that correct? Is that what you understand? The one is it would be Biden. Thank you, Dan. Steven. Yeah, okay. yes. I think so. I know I had the conversation with him about it, but but I think yeah, he places it as Biden, not as Trump. But I could be wrong. Was, uh, Biden was he not the one that comes as a short time? So Trump, you have no. I think that's wrong. I think Trump is the fifth, and then or sorry, yeah, uh, yeah, Trump's the sixth. So he has Biden Trump will be here thing. for 
Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. So, so you're putting it the same way. Yeah, so so what you would be having then is Biden would be the seventh. He would be there for like a short space. So that's how Colin and does then, it? And no, so Trump would be the eighth out of the seven. So he, but you he, have Trump uh, as the sixth. So Trump is the sixth, yes. Okay, okay. So yeah, he's doing it backwards. Okay. Now that makes more sense. Okay. Um, now, when we do that, of course, we're not interpreting the prophecy that way. We're, we're taking a parallel of history and lining it up, correct? So, so one thing we need to be clear about, that we don't believe that we can take, um, you know, Revelation 12, 13, or 17, and just directly make the heads to be popes or kings or anything like that, right? That first we understand the prophecy and how it was fulfilled. And then we make an application of it to the presidents of the United States. Is that correct? Yes, I believe it's an application. Okay. Now, uh, Uriah Smith doesn't have that, um, we'll say, privilege to see things that way, right? He's just going to look at how was this prophecy fulfilled? Now, we have the privileges. We can say we can look at the prophecies on how they were fulfilled, and we can see a parallel with, the pro with events in our time. That is, we have reasons why we line up the presidents of the United States with the kings of Persia. And then we're going to make this application. This is the thing that basically Colin saw is that he could take these seven heads. He could take the beast of Revelation 17, connect it to Daniel 11, verse one or verse two, I guess it is. And, um, and verse one and two. And then he could also connect this to Daniel chapter three, right? So he connects these three chapters together. And so he makes then an application that in the Sunday law, we have this image that's all gold, right? So it connects Babylon all the way to the end. And then he says, we can see in Daniel chapter 11, we can see the United States of Persia, but it's going to be Persia all the way through to the Sunday law. He's going to take um, Alexander, his history, and just attach it to the Sunday law. And then he's going to look at Revelation 17 and say, well, we've already applied the presidents of the United States to the kings of Persia. And, and if we do that, we can look at our history and we can line up, you know, five are fallen, one is, one yet to come. And when he comes, he'll continue a short space. And then we're going to have uh, this eighth that's of the seven. Right. So that so the seventh, it continues a short space, but it's going to continue a short space with a period in which, um, you know, there's different ways we look at. It. But you, you start to see what I'm saying here. Right. How we're we're constructing this and and some of the premises that we have to have. If we're going to build that argument. Now, I take the position tentatively, at least. That when we have made the application to Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, U.S., and the U.N., that that isn't the primary way in which you would understand Revelation 17, the heads of Revelation 17. But I don't think that application is incorrect. It's just that it's an application. That, that, that has been my position, that we... We can't just say that's how it's fulfilled, but we can make an application of that. So, so that is, we, we can sort of have it both ways. So maybe that's, some people might say that's, um, um, I can't think of the word that was used, but basically, uh, you know, like sitting on the fence, being non-committal, you know, sort of hedging my bets or something like that. Um, but but I think that that's consistent with how we've understood many things in prophecy, 
that we can look at how the prophecy is fulfilled and we can make an application of it. Right? So, <clears throat> so anyway, that's the issue. That to me right here, this paragraph in front of you, dealing with um, uh, is that we have to we have to recognize the time in which the explanation is given. But we also need to see that the prophecy has a fulfillment um, that isn't the application that, that Colin has been making, right? And so then we have to say, if we're going to apply it to the presidents of the United States, we might be able to apply it in ways that we haven't seen, and it might give us some more light. Okay, so... Um, now, he says some he things here, according to the uniform showing of symbolic prophecy, if one symbol was designed to take in at one view all the great governments of the world, the symbol by which this is shown should have been introduced while the first of those governments was reigning power instead of waiting till one or more of them had passed away and then giving us a picture of their ghosts after they had gone into their graves. This is a bad argument. So he's just making an argument. Uh, we're, we're using symbols. And we can't just introduce a symbol and attach it to the papacy, or not to the papacy, to Babylon, that wasn't introduced at the time. And, and I'm not really sure why he's even trying to make this argument. Um, and if you read this over, maybe somebody can understand it better than me. Um, so if we just read on here, he says... Um, um, but it is not said of those first beasts that when their dominion was taken away, their lives were prolonged. Yes, but it was only for a season and a time. Or is it not said of those? Yeah, for a season and a time. It is not intimated that the life of the first beast is continued till the time of the fourth, or that the lives of the second and third were so continued. So we know Babylon no longer exists, right? We don't look at you know, Iraq is being Babylon. Now, so if if Uriah Smith was consistent with this argument, uh, does the king of the north uh, of Greece still exist? So this is dealing with the, the Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45. Because if he was consistent, he would apply that argument to Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Right. He wouldn't he wouldn't all of a sudden introduce this. Um, uh, you know, this new power coming against uh, or having Turkey and Egypt coming against because does Turkey and Egypt exist in the prophetic prophetic sense as part of the Greek Empire? Did the Greek Empire still exist? Uh, in 1798 as um, being split into these two parts of uh, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic empires, or did they cease to exist? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I just think that this, this argument is a red herring. He's just presenting an argument. It's, it's a contingent argument. It doesn't really apply. It's not a good argument, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't say anything. Um, and it would contradict other things he said other places. Because if he's going to have the king of the north being Turkey, we can't have that. Because we know Turkey is not the king of the north, right? Is Islam the king of the north? Or even the king of the south? No. No. No, right? So, so he's, he's, if he's making this argument that, well, it can't be Babylon because Babylon didn't exist anymore, then he would have to apply to Daniel chapter 11, verse 30, you know, verse 40, saying, you know, the king of the north or the king of the south comes against him or pushes against him, whatever it is, uh, and saying that's pushing against France. Well, Egypt is not the king of the south and Turkey is not the king of the north. In 1798, right? The king of the south is France. King of the north is the papacy. 
So, so these, these are types of arguments that uh, Uriah Smith uses. They're, they're arguments that once you delve into them, um, he's just making an argument. It's like arguing with the flat earth. You make one argument and then you bring up another point and they give you another argument that completely contradicts the argument they just gave you. But that doesn't matter because they're just dealing with one argument at a time. So, so you can't you can't use this argument. Uriah Smith can't use it and be consistent with what he's taught other places. Okay, so so we can argue. Um, you know, so he says here in the vision of Daniel seven, in which Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece are brought to view consecutively under their own specific symbols. It is not till the fourth or Roman kingdom is reached that the future of the ten horns is introduced because it was out of Rome alone that the ten kingdoms symbolized by those ten horns were to be developed. But when we come to the vision of the great red dragon of Revelation 12, these same ten horns again appear, showing that the vision of John does not begin till the time of the fourth beast of the prophecy of Daniel 7. So he's just saying the horns didn't exist um, in Babylon, Media, Persia, or Greece. They did exist in the 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 last beast and so that this is the time of of that so that's fine it is not intimated that these 10 horns were confined to one of the heads of the dragon but they were common to all the heads one to every head and two to a sufficient number to make out the 10 but if one of these heads represented babylon another meter persia another greece the 10 horns would pertain as much to them as any of any other heads but this was not the case. Um, now, this is, again, a poor argument, because what to, if these heads represent Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, pagan Rome, papal, the U.S., and then the U.N., we're not saying it actually represents those kingdoms consecutively as they occur. We're just saying that the beast itself has the characteristics of all of these kingdoms that it conquered, it succeeded from, right? Right? So if you if you look at Revelation 13, for instance, in the time of the papacy, does Babylon exist? No, it doesn't exist. No. Right. So we're not saying that in the, the papacy has a kingdom of Babylon. We're just saying that it's a succession of that kingdom. Right. So that it has characteristics of Babylon, its characteristics of Medo-Persia and its characteristics of Greece. Right. So those heads, in the way that I've understood them, aren't the nations themselves, but characteristics of those nations that the beast has in Revelation 13. Does the beast have the body of a leopard? In Revelation 13. Yeah, it has. Okay. Does that mean that it's that Rome is Greece? No, it's not. It has the feet of a bear. It has the mouth of a lion. So if it has the heads of those kingdoms, that's that's consistent with it having a body makeup of those kingdoms. Right? So you can see how poor this argument is. Because you're going to say, well, the heads can't possibly be Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And yet the body is Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, right? right? You know what I'm saying? And, and it, it's in a sense Rome too, just because it has, it's this diverse beast of Revelation 17. It's not like any other beast. It's a composite beast. So, so you can see it doesn't have to be in the time of Babylon that this beast exists. We know the beast of Revelation 13 is the papal beast. It's the papal kingdom. It just says papal Rome right on the 1843 chart. And yet it has a body of a leopard, feet of a bear, mouth of a lion. Okay. So you can see that this argument is faulty, right? Can people see that? So people can build arguments for things, as Uriah Smith did here, uh, that are faulty arguments. 
Now, then he says, now, this is the one that we were touching on already, and we're just going to finish with this. We got about 10 more minutes. Okay, so the chronological standpoint from which John speaks is that of his own time. He was just so with the prophet Daniel. He tells when he had his visions, where he was, and the circumstances then existing. So John says, I was in Isle called Patmos on the Lord's Day and had a vision in which the angel told me such and such things. And so when the angel, in his more particular explanations of the heads of Revelation 17, says of them to John that five had passed away and one is, etc. He shows that the heads are consecutive and that five were in the past and that John was living under the sixth. Now, we would agree um, with this idea that where, wherever that John is in this explanation, that five are past. So this goes against his earlier argument, because if they are successive kingdoms, we're not saying that those kingdoms existed in 1798 or even in the time of John, right? We're just saying that, that this kingdom is a continuation, in a sense, of all of those kingdoms. Because in Daniel chapter 2, when we see this image, the head of gold, the arms and belly, or, of, uh, or the arms and, and breast or, of, of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, and the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay. We don't argue that the head is separate from the shoulders and the arms, right? We don't argue that because it's all one image, right? Even though it's a progression of kingdoms, it is one thing. It is the kingdoms of this world. Now, it's given in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. The other kingdoms haven't come yet. But we can see that they are a continuation of Rome. Because if Rome is the head, are the legs part, or not Rome is the head, if Babylon's the head, are the legs part of Babylon? The legs are part of the image, right? So just because they're consecutive, and you can say that that five are fallen, one is, it doesn't mean that those five have to be things that exist at the time of Rome, right? I mean, just in the very context of it, even if you're in the time of the Rome, you say, say five are fallen. Those are things that happened before. They could happen those kingdoms could have existed before Rome, right? It's just that that beast at that time is representing Rome, but it has these characteristics. For instance, if, and it's, you know, this is an if, but let's say if Daniel was given the vision of Daniel chapter 2, given that in the time if he lived in the time of Rome, or let's say if John, let's do it this way. If John was in the book of Revelation, given uh, the vision of Daniel chapter two, if that was given to John, because in a sense it was in all of these other uh, uh, visions, right? He's repeating the visions of Daniel, but he's pre repeating them from the perspective of his time, right? Because right, we know that about Revelation. It's it's the complement to the book of Daniel. Now, he doesn't use an image, but let's say if God had chosen uh, an image to represent what's happening, and it had an image, and, you know, let's say it was the emperor of, of Rome and, you know, who had the dream, and he says, well, you are the legs of iron, you know. Um, there would be no problem in understanding that Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece had succeeded the time of the legs. He would just be in the time of the legs. Or if he was in the time of the feet, if he was, you know, if this was in the time of the papacy and you had a prophet who was given this vision, you would just see that you're a continuation of something. So it's not inconsistent to say that the 
that the beast of Revelation 12, that the head, the heads can represent these kingdoms that preceded, especially when we see in chapter 17, it says five are fallen. Right. It just shows that you're a continuation of something, that you're part of the past. And we already know that. We know that from the vision of chapter two, Daniel chapter two. We know that from um, Daniel chapter seven, that these are all a continuation. But in chapter two, you can see they're all one image. Right. So so I think it's a poor argument. To say just because you're in this time that you can't have these other things. So, so we have this chronological point. And, and so he just argued against it. Five are in the past. Now he's living under the sixth. So then he says, any correct application of these heads, therefore, must show the political power of the symbol vested in the sixth head in AD 96. Now, that, of course, is the crux of the whole argument that he's making. He's saying the explanation has to be when John was living, not where John is seeing the vision, not when this vision was given or, or where the vision is taking you to. It's going to be in the time when the vision was given, not in the time that it's looking to. To say that John speaks from the standpoint of some inter, indeterminate future time and see, that's nobody says it's an indeterminate future time, do they? We actually have a very determinate future time. We're saying at the end of the 1260. So it's kind of a, a bad argument here. A time when five of the heads would have passed away in the sixth be reigning without giving the least intimation as to when that time would be. So nobody does that, do they? Yeah. Okay. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I'm just going to finish now. So we're going to come back to this tomorrow. And um, if anybody has questions, you can email me if you have some other things you want us to look at. But is this helping us sort of see what the problem is? What we have to solve? I hope it's helpful. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We just ask for your presence throughout this day. Bring us together again, according to thy will, uh, to study your word. And we pray for each person studying these things, that you can bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.